All right, in this second lecture, I want us to uh, explore the theological foundations of religious liberty with a higher degree of kind of specificity. And the first point to kind of help us think about things is to ask the question, why did I write this book called Liberty for All? I'm guessing some people here have it uh, in possession. Um, this book was a modified version of my dissertation. Um, it's slightly less boring than my dissertation, so don't let that be a deterrence from, from reading the book. That's why you work with editors to de-boring things, to make things less boring, you know? But what happened was I got interested in the subject of religious liberty, and I realized when I surveyed how Christians thought about religious liberty they actually more often than not did not have like sophisticated biblical theological uh, grounding for religious liberty. It was more kind of a verse here, a verse there that can kind of create the skeletal architecture of something like religious liberty. But more often than not, because of Christians living in America and we have this broad protection provided to us by the First Amendment, more often than not, most Christians thought about um, religious liberty as a constitutional reality more than they did a theological reality. And so the book that I wrote, and we're going to discuss um, kind of some of the three core pillars, is grounding a doctrine or a social ethic of religious liberty in anthropology, missiology, and then eschatology. And I'm going to unpack what those terms mean. Uh, with with more specificity here in a little bit. Um, now, in the previous lecture, I offered uh, a definition of religious liberty uh, that read as the following, that every individual, regardless of their religious confession, is equally free to believe or not to believe and to live out their understanding of the conscience's duty, individually and communally, that is owed to God in all areas of life without threat of government penalty or social harassment is nothing short of grasping the truth and ordering one's life in response to it. Um, I obviously adopt and endorse that definition, um, but I want to kind of uh, think about this more Christocentrically. That definition that I offered earlier today is a definition I think a lot of various traditions could arrive at. I'm thinking here, how do we think about religious liberty theologically as Christians? And here's just a few kind of key points I would make here, is that first and foremost, religious liberty, it helps us understand the relationship between temporal authority and eternal authority. I'll say this a little bit later. Matthew 22, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. Actually, uh, one scholar argues, who I really respect, he argues that is actually one of the most important passages for an embryonic developing saga of religious liberty simply by virtue of the fact that Jesus subordinates government's rule beneath a higher rule. And the fact that Jesus would decouple religious and political powers actually dethrones or defangs the power of government. Uh, in Jesus' time, and again, we just can't relate to this. Um, in Jesus' time, Caesars were divine beings. So for, for you to have um, Jesus come along and say, well, no, Caesar can claim certain things over you, but it can't claim everything over you, is actually um, a, a tremendous defanging of government power, saying it's actually under the watchful gaze of God. Um, thinking here, modern day North Korea. I mentioned this in my first lecture. I watched a documentary a few years ago on National Geographic of individuals who were receiving cataract surgeries um, from a state healthcare facility in North Korea. And upon leaving the recovery room, the first thing these individuals did was to throw themselves down in front of a portrait of Kim Jong un and weep and wail and worship it. That sounds like y'all might think I'm making that up. I'm not making it up. And the fact 
that that is so foreign and so absurd to our thinking is actually a way that it demonstrates the fruits and legacy of having a religious liberty culture where, I mean, a part of being American is to like bash your rulers, <laughs> which is something you, you know, we take for granted. Uh, then other nations, you do that, uh, you're going to end up in jail, perhaps. Uh, James Madison, who I don't believe was an Orthodox Christian, said something fascinating uh, in his document, Memorial and Remonstrance Against Religious Assessments, that before any man can be considered as a member of civil society, he must be considered as a subject of the governor of the universe. That's actually a profound statement. Again, offered by someone who's arguably uh, deistic theologically. But he's arriving at a truth that correlates to a Christian idea here. And the idea here is um, before government can lay claim over you, God can lay claim over you. And that there are pre-political realities that we receive as image bearers of God that governments are then called to recognize and protect, not define and decree. Massive, massive principles here. Madison argues, <coughs> excuse me. Madison argues that religion recognizes realities that impress truths upon individuals prior to the authority of the state. Um, and this is just the case. Whether someone is expressly religious or not, every conscience is going to reckon with what is true or false and then to live accordingly. So again, the first principle here is it religious liberty helps understand the relationship between temporal authority and eternal authority. But then as Christians, it helps us to uh, ask a more ultimate question, which is really how is one saved? How is one saved? So you think about something like conversions at the end of a sword. Well, coerced faith is a contradiction in terms. Faith by nature must be that which is voluntarily grasped and voluntarily assented to. As I said in my first lecture, Acts 17, 30-31 where uh, it says the times of ignorance God overlooked, but he, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And to this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Um, that is the exaltation of Christ as having supreme authority. Meaning, you know, we, we don't, we don't, have moral agnosticism about whether someone's views are right or wrong or not, or whether someone's religious views are right or wrong or not. We're simply trying to say, to, to, to give the government the type of power to make overweening judgments on religious claims uh, is, a, is a dangerous power grab for uh, the, the government to, to lay claim and authority over. That, that Jesus is the judge of the conscience. If Jesus is the judge of the conscience, the state then is not. Okay, so as we think about how Christianity has conceived of religious liberty, some really fascinating details emerge. Um, historians will argue that the first example of religious liberty emerging on the world's stage comes from Christianity. Uh, one of those arguments, and I'll discuss later on, is, is Matthew 22. Remember, rendered Caesar what is Caesar's, rendered to God what belongs to God, carving up different jurisdictions where the state is operating from what the church is operating. But then interestingly enough, in the early church, there are two figures by the name of Tertullian and Lactantius. Tertullian and Lactantius, who his secular historians argue you begin to see something like religious liberty emerge. And their effective argument is this. 
is that a person's conscience is theirs, and because it's theirs, it should be left free. And that because individuals perceive who God is on their own terms, there shouldn't be any type of intermediary that comes in and disrupts a person's relationship between themselves and God. Now, we're talking right now at the level of, of intellect and ideas and the conscience's grasp of these realities. We're not yet talking about how does this cash out in society when bad things happen in the name of religion. We can restrict religious liberty. There is, and that might be something to say right now, religious liberty is good, absolutely. I've written a book on the subject. I've given my life's time to the subject. It is not absolute. You cannot do anything you want just because you say, well, my God told me to. You might want to say the words, well, God told me to do that type of thing. And if you then act on that thing, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be potentially arrested. And that's entirely acceptable. In that situation, we want legislators to make those determinations of what those lines are, not unelected judges. That's the key importance there. Um, I'm so glad to be, though, at Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary, because religious liberty is a Baptist distinctive. Um, We consider ourselves heirs of the Reformation. We are probably more kind of stepchildren of the Reformation. Here's why. Uh, Luther and Calvin, I love Luther and Calvin. I am uh, devotedly reformed in my theology. And I also want to say with clear conscience and just utmost integrity, I think Calvin and Luther were wrong on church day matters. I think they were just simply wrong. I think they were men of their time and they were used to arrangements uh, that were problematic and bloody even, uh, and which I'll talk about in the third lecture, led to Western Europe. I mean, so, so much strife and bloodshed happened in the name of Protestants and Catholics killing each other that new social arrangements came out of the Peace of Westphalia because we basically said, okay, we got to stop killing each other in the name of religion. How do we sort this out? So this is a Baptist distinctive. Figures like Roger Williams, figures like John Leland, figures like Isaac Backus are some of the stalwart giants in the theory of religious liberty. And in particular, John Leland and Isaac Backus had an impact on James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. That's just in the historical record. Why have Baptists traditionally been advocates for religious liberty? Because if you go to the founding colonial period, um, Baptists weren't popular. If you were preaching without a license from an established church, you could be imprisoned. You could be horsewhipped. So religious liberty was born out of persecution and fundamentally, and and for constitutional reasons, it protects minorities from powerful majorities. This is why we believe it's a consistent principle of of religious liberty, that if, if what you are convinced is true is really true, and it just falls out of favor with the, the crowd around you, Um, I think it's really a blessing of common grace that our laws say, you know, um, crowds can't disturb your rights. Majorities can't disturb your rights. So religious liberty there is to protect minority viewpoints. Okay, so let's talk more about the uh, theology of religious liberty, the three pillars that I alluded to. The first category is the category of anthropology. And we can just call this a shorthand for the image of, of God. So when we look at what it means to be made in God's image, theologians have come up with several kind of core constitutive items that define image bearing. Uh, Three for our purposes today, one of them would be reason, the capacity for reason, that we have a conscience, that we have the capacity for deliberation. We're not saying that where you end 
with your judgment and your deliberation is right. Not saying that at all. We're simply saying that God has made us cognitive, reasonable, rational beings who think. Second principle here is a principle of what we call self-constitution. Self-constitution. This refers to our kind of existential capacity to want to live in accord with our settled judgments. So leave it to academics to to make simple things sound really, really complex, to complexify things, as someone would say. What am I really getting at? Okay, you think about things in your head, you deliberate, then what do you want to do? You want to live that out. You want to constitute your existence and yourself in accordance with your conscience. Now, as Christians, we would say that this, this reflects our willingness to live according to God's norms. Uh, self-constitution, we, we, we might refer to this as the internal integrity of the soul. The internal integrity of the soul. Meaning that we just are the types of creatures who want to live authentically. Non-Christians want to do that. And in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit um, here in a second about how secular non-believing individuals are relying on principles of religious liberty in their own life, even if they're not expressly religious themselves. Now, third principle here is a principle of freedom in relationship to anthropology. Freedom, you might call this a lack of external constraint. But God has granted us moral freedom to choose how we order our lives. I may completely disagree with someone how how someone chooses to order their life. I cannot enter that person's conscience and enter their mind on their behalf and change it. What do I have to do? I have to plead. I have to argue. I have to persuade. That's something that is done on a voluntary basis. So without freedom, you want to think in in the converse here, without freedom, we would be locked in the silos of our minds and souls, unable to give outward expression to our inner thoughts and decisions. These are things we just take for granted every single day. You woke up this morning, you had coffee, you made your way here, you're listening to the bald guy talk about religious liberty. Why? Because this was your choice. You've chosen to do this. Um, I've got a friend of mine who is one of the most uh, selfless, self-giving, loving individuals I've ever met. He'll do anything for anyone if if asked. But the minute you say, hey, Matt, uh, you need to do that. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. Nope. I think he probably has like oppositional defiance disorder or something like that. Why? Because as human beings, it's not that we're just kind of like inner libertarians necessarily. Uh, And we obviously we can abuse our freedom. Absolutely. I'm not trying to defend unchecked freedom. I'm simply getting at the fact that we are the types of beings who act implicitly and explicitly on inner desires for freedom every single day. Okay, so how might it be that even non-Christians are relying on religious liberty? Um, I I have what I call the three A's of religious liberty, even for secular people, the three A's. The three A's are this, authority, adoration, authenticity. Authority, adoration, authenticity. And you might even call, I mean, this is a bigger discussion we can have, and and scholars debate whether you should call religious liberty religious liberty or whether you should call it conscience freedom or freedom of religion and belief. Scholars debate that. But this all speaks to the, the way that God has made us. So authority. What I mean here is every single person accepts some God or some ideology or some worldview as what guides them. Everyone does. It's a question of whether or not they are conscious of what is guiding them when they wake up. 
Everyone has an authority. Secondly, adoration, meaning everyone is giving their love and their honor and their esteem to something. Augustine, obviously not a canonical voice, but a a very respected theologian in Christian history. Augustine argues that you can actually understand who human beings are at their core based on the quality and character of their loves. A person is more virtuous to the extent that they love more lovely things, and they are more vice-driven to the extent that they love less lovely things. But everyone has some type of adoration in the heart. And then third is authenticity. Everyone then wants to then live sincere lives of integrity in response to what they adore and what they have given an authority to. Now, when we think more about kind of anthropology and the anthropology section for this lecture will be the longest part of the, of the lecture. This is where um, we get to issues of human dignity and natural rights. Now, what shocked me was when I was reading my dissertation or writing my dissertation and researching it was to basically have non-Christian secular historians make the argument that the value valuing individuals and things like human rights don't emerge on the world stage until Christians come about. So we all take these principles for granted. Prior to the Judeo-Christian tradition, human beings were seen as dispensable cogs to be done away with simply at the will of those who have, have power over the powerless. Christianity comes along and says, oh, um, we're not going to practice leaving infants uh, to be exposed to the elements. We're going to take these children in. Uh, it's funny, people want to, to characterize the Apostle Paul as like this patriarchal misogynist in our day. Uh, the problem is, if you understand Paul in his context, Paul was actually pretty radical in extending dignity and nobility. So in Galatians 3, uh, neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew or Gentile, like that's that's like, I hate to use the word progressive because it means something in our context. That was radically progressive in his context. Um, individuals like Douglas Murray, he's a, a British intellectual today. Uh, he's an atheist. He wrote an article in 2014 that I absolutely love. I, I, I love it when atheists end up doing the work of Christian apologetics for us. He writes an article and says, can atheism create human dignity? And he says there's really three options. The first option is to really hammer out and work out an atheistic doctrine of human dignity. But he's like, we haven't done that. We gotta keep doing it if we're going to. Secondly, we can acknowledge that we can't create human dignity because we really don't have any real moral standards. And he says, we should just stare over the abyss and recognize at the end of that is just darkness. It's intellectually honest. I appreciate that. Or third, he says, we should go back to church and recognize that human dignity is something that cannot survive without Christianity. And this is what other historians make the argument as well. So we're talking about rights and religious liberty it all assumes some intrinsic value of the human person that secularism cannot account for on its own. If you accept a Darwinian naturalistic account of the world, all we are in here are highly adapted carbon molecules. The problem is that in an atheistic and materialist account of the universe, Carbon molecules do not have objective moral value. So rights, and this is just absolutely the case, rights in kind of a materialistic accounting of the universe are just negotiations. 
between competing power claims. Uh, they are what Francis Schaeffer referred to as arbitrary imperatives. It's a wonderful phrase, arbitrary imperatives. So you have the UN Declaration on Human Rights that most of us applaud, freedom of speech, freedom of symbol, freedom of religion, and then there are reproductive rights, which means the right to kill an unborn child. Okay, that negates what rights are because rights are bound by the idea that human beings have intrinsic rights. And we don't parcel out rights simply based on the size, the level of development, or the environment of where human beings are. It's inconsistent. So that means rights, divorced from Christianity, are just arbitrary imperatives shifting with the winds of morality. Uh, Martin Luther argued that, that rights are checks against government power. He said this, that temporal government has laws which extend no further than to life and property and external affairs on earth. For God cannot and will not permit anyone but himself to rule over the soul. Therefore, where the temporal authority presumes to prescribe laws for the soul, it encroaches upon God's government and only misleads souls and destroys them. Luther was right there. He's right. He's wrong elsewhere on some issues. So what, let's talk about civil rights in the context of, of, of moral rights and religious liberty. Civil rights are just legal protections of moral rights. I'll say that again. Civil rights are legal protections of moral rights. But that raises the question, then, then how do we kind of explain or enumerate what our rights ought to be? Um, generally speaking, I'm going to say that our rights as image bearers stem from what I would call creation order realities. Genesis 1 and 2 realities. So life, family, liberty. That's where kind of rights come from. And, and Christian thought has reflected deeply on the relationship between theology, natural rights, and political rights. And there's a broad consensus among Christian thinkers that rights, as we know them, please hear me, this is so important, we, and we need to be thinking about this as Christians more and more. <coughs> rights, as we know them, emanate, or they come from moral duties that God commands of human subjects. Rights stem from duties. Uh, Carl F.H. Henry, one of my theological heroes, he says this, the Bible has a doctrine of divinely imposed duties. What moderns call human rights are the contingent flip side of those duties. So the logic of a Christian view of rights is this. A moral duty requires the corresponding ability to carry out that duty. If human beings have a moral obligation to seek God with all of their heart, soul, strength, and mind, then that duty requires the freedom to do all that is necessary to attain that end. So the ability to fulfill these duties requires some sort of protective horizon to exist to facilitate one's ability to exercise one's duty with the reasonable assurance that you can do so. Uh, one scholar writes this, rights and duties are reciprocal in nature. If I have a fundamental right to something, others have the duty to guard and protect that right. And that's why we have laws. Laws are restrictions on person's behaviors so that other individuals can have the freedom to live out the duties that are incumbent upon them as human beings so that they can flourish. And laws provide that protective horizon to say, you should be free to do this. You, you shouldn't be impeded. If someone does impede your ability, your right to life, i.e. they murder you, they've, they've 
made the final act of nullification of rights. Therefore, that person is going to go to jail. And then the law has a pedagogical teaching component to it and says, well, uh, I don't want to go to jail. So I don't want to murder people. So I'm not going to murder because I want to live my life. That person wants to live their life. So rights fundamentally are shaped by duties. Now, you might be thinking, is this just slipping into kind of loosey-goosey moral relativism? How how does the fact that people do wrong in the name of right factor into this? The Christian tradition has argued that there is no intrinsic right to do wrong. Vice. There is no intrinsic right to do error. A right to do vice or to, to pursue error would imply that vice fulfills a person's nature just as much as good duties do. Rather, a, a regime or a government, <coughs> excuse me, a regime might maintain a posture of allowance of those things that are bad, but an allowance is not the same thing as an endorsement. There is no right in itself to do vice for the sake of vice. Vice results from the misfiring of liberties that were originally intended for the facilitating of the good. What this means is, please hear me, this is very important, especially on religious liberty issues. I'm not defending the Muslim's right to worship Allah at an absolute theological level. Why? Because there is no theological right to rebel against God. Government establishes a political right in order for you to be able to pursue God as best as you pursue God, as you can grasp God. So that means the Muslim and the Christian and the Jew are all on equal legal footing in this conversation. I think the Muslim is in error All I'm doing is respecting the integrity of the faculty of their mind that I can't change myself, even though I wish I could. I just have to accept that if I'm going to pursue truth how I want to pursue truth because I know Christ and I think that is absolute truth and the government has granted me that right to pursue that truth, what then must I do? I have to make allowances for people who I think are wrong to be wrong in the same way that the Muslim thinks that we're all wrong and that basically we have a right to be wrong in our understanding of what the truth is. So religious liberty as the ability to allow individuals to pursue, grasp, and live out their understanding of the truth, or is the ability to allow individuals to pursue, grasp, and live out their understanding of truth. When understood from this perspective, religious liberty is integrally tied to human dignity and human flourishing. Rights fundamentally protect the agency of persons to fulfill duties. And one of those duties that human beings have is to honor conscience. Because again, this gets back to the principle of self-constitution. A person who is not free to constitute their existence according to their own conscience is is having their personhood robbed. So we defend liberty not to protect people's right to error, but to protect their ability to live in accordance with their grasp of truth as best as they can grasp it. All right, second principle. We had anthropology. We're now moving to missiology. And the last two are, are much shorter. Missiology is really just the study of the advancement of God's redemptive purpose for the world. And I think, based on that definition, religious liberty is tied to the logic of the gospel because the freedom to communicate, the freedom to convert without fear of arrest or execution is beneficial to the proclamation and spreading of the gospel largely, at large. I don't think, please hear me, God's mission is going to go forward in whatever context. 
China and North Korea are not actually impediments to God's will. God will go, his mission will go where God wants his mission to go. What I'm arguing for from an earthly perspective is we should not be actively seeking out regimes that hinder our ability to engage in missiological activity. That would be counterintuitive, to put it mildly. Now, thinking missiologically, there's also a principle of what I would call vibrancy. Vibrancy. Meaning that faith that is voluntary is by nature more robust and vibrant faith. I'll talk about this more in the third lecture, is that there's a great irony. You would think, perhaps, at the surface level, that if you have established religion, established religion means people are going to be more religious. Right? Because, well, it has the assistance and aid of the church, therefore people are more religious because there's more religious verbiage and symbology in, in, in the public square. Except that's just not the case, sociologically. If you want proof of that, I present to you the Anglican establishment. There is nothing more dead or heretical and feckless, in my opinion, than the Anglican establishment that has an established arrangement with uh, the crown. But what do we know? Religiosity is just precipitously declining in Western Europe, where state churches were the norm. And in fact, sociologists have made the observation going far as back as in the 1830s that what has made America unique was its high religious participation and voluntary participation. Why? Because it was done not from the top down, but from the bottom up. So personal commitment and voluntaristic participation actually breeds a more vibrant faith. Um, a third principle related to missiology is um, the fact that Christians... Uh, if I were to ask what this church does to like love its neighbor, um, it it probably may, I have a, might have a food kitchen. You might help the the poor. Um, the history of hospitals and food banks, homeless shelters, charity organizations, adoption orphanages. Those come from Christianity. So, having a system of laws that allows Christians to practice their faith freely allows us to love our neighbors. Um, another principle here of what I would call civil tranquility and social cooperation. Religious liberty is really useful because it allows us to settle debate apart from fists and bullets. Um, I have a neighbor across the street from me. And my neighbor is as politically liberal as I am politically conservative. When my wife and I put up a pro-life yard sign in a political cycle, they put up two pro-choice yard signs, like that type of moral disagreement. He's a nice guy. He's polite. We share no worldview in common. The only thing we may share in common is we both agree that we believe in democracy and we're willing to work out our differences in a voting booth not at the end of a fist. And so constitutional procedures are actually helpful in de-escalating social conflict. All right, third principle is eschatology. Eschatology is a big seminary word. Here we're talking about matters of ultimate authority and the direction to which history is ultimately moving. And we begin with a simple principle is that government is not sovereign. God, government has an authority. The authority that it has is a derived authority, meaning it has legitimate authority, but it is an authority given to it by God. It does not have raw, unchecked, sovereign authority. Uh, I mentioned this once already, Matthew 22. The exchange with Jesus, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, 
give to God what belongs to God. Momentous in the history of political philosophy to say nothing really of, of even theology because it is uh, removing absolute power from the place of the state and the government. Meaning that that, that inherently makes government limited. I don't mean limited in like a, a conservative talking point like Fox News Rush Limbaugh limited government. Talking about this from a theological level of limited government is biblical because unlimited government is not. So limited government is just a, a fact of the fact that its power is derived, comes from God. I mentioned this once already, but Acts 17, 30-31 we are insistent that Christ has ultimate authority over the conscience of man. Humans do not. I may disagree with someone. I, I feel like I disagree professionally for a living. But I cannot myself pronounce judgment over their soul. That belongs to God. So let's air our differences. Let's get all the viewpoints out on the table. An honest airing of viewpoints saying, I'm going to disagree with you, but I cannot pronounce judgment over your soul that belongs to God. Now, very importantly, as we're thinking about eschatology and matters of ultimate authority, something we need to think about in terms of the timeline of redemptive history, and it's this, is that scripture has not given either us or the government the ability to eliminate viewpoint difference through force. We live in a Genesis 8 world. We I'm sorry, not Genesis 8. Romans 8 world. We live in a Genesis 3 world. We live in a time of what I, what I consider, and, and, and these words are important, normative but lamentable pluralism. Normative but lamentable pluralism. Meaning that until Christ returns, we have to expect that there are going to be people who disagree with us. The question then becomes, what do we do with that disagreement? Do we arrest them? Throw them in prison? Do we execute them? Or do we socially marginalize bad viewpoints? We cannot possibly remove all viewpoint difference in this age. And if we, have one, if we have a government that wants to do that, that has become a government that is arguably tyrannical and totalitarian. Which means we lament this. I wish everyone in the world thought like you and I in this room. But they don't. So then what is it incumbent upon us? we actually have to do the hard work of sharing the gospel. We have to do the hard work of making arguments. What this means is that we live in an age of what I call contestability. It's an age of contestability. We have to be willing to make those arguments in light of living in a, a Genesis 3 not a Genesis 1 and 2 world. Um, very recently on social media, I saw a, a pastor who was trying to be really provocative, uh, calling for an end to the First Amendment because this pastor was arguing that the First Amendment gives too much freedom to too many errant views. Now, I think that that is wrong, uh, but I appreciate this individual saying this out loud. Um, here's why, because it is virtually impossible to find an example in history to validate this particular pastor's plea where a nation with an established church or one with a coercive legal regime that was designed to protect and privilege Christianity, where that's proven successful. It's not proven successful. 
Why is that? Because Christianity is not chiefly a political program. It cannot be advanced through unregenerate mechanisms. That is why the centrality of the church and how you define the church is of uttermost significance to the question of religious liberty and why I am a Baptist. Because we believe the church, the local congregation, has the keys of the kingdom and the government does not. So we can quote reformers and Puritans till our heart's desires. And the reformers and Puritans were basically arguing for church-state arrangements where they were kind of hand in glove. But the fact of the matter remains this, that governments cannot self-consciously order citizens or their entire political community to eternal life. They just can't do it. And it's never been attempted without strife, bloodshed, disappointment, and failure as its result. And I'll be saying more about this in the third lecture. The problem is that today we're living in a moment where there's kind of this ascendancy of voices who are arguing for whether you call it Christian nationalism or Christian reconstructionism or some type of establishmentarianism who are saying, well, trust us, we've finally got the recipe correct. The problem with that is we've got roughly 600 years of history to say every time where that has been practiced, it has never been successful. The church and only the church orders to eternal life because it and it alone has a singular vocation that is not parallel to that of the government. Now, please hear me. Is this a blank check for all viewpoints to roam free? No, it is not. Lines are going to get drawn everywhere. But political theology that calls for kind of overturning liberal democracy or overturning the First Amendment is calling for something it has never succeeded in accomplishing previously. That is just a historical fact. And this is because I think there's a theological problem. It paves over the very real and ineradicable reality of the antithesis of Genesis chapter 3. So, Biblical political theology has to do two things. It has to accommodate to the reality of Genesis 3 without falling into license, meaning creating too much moral libertarianism where we just destroy ourselves in the name of liberty. But it also has to figure out how to ameliorate the effects of Genesis 3 without falling into ten- to tyranny. So that's, that's, that's the constant political tension in political philosophy. The tension is how to reconcile order and liberty. And if you don't have a doctrine of Genesis 3 in the antithesis, you are going to be creating a problematic government foundation. So there's no perfect formula to accomplish this, but, but heavy-handed censor, censorship, authoritarianism uh, have a history of collateral damage proving just how unworkable this is. And that's because no earthly system, no political ge- regime can or will ignore the effects of Genesis 3 because, again, why is that? Because we are living on God's timeline not man's. God will establish his kingdom on his own time. That's when viewpoint difference will finally be eliminated. And until that point in time, societies are going to be filled with sinners and constant negotiations uh, to figure out how to settle disagreements without resorting to arresting people, um, killing people or, or banishing people unjustly.